Well, hello everyone. I hope you're all keeping well. I hope you're all staying safe. I hope you're all keeping socially distanced. Um, again, we're getting back into those strange times again, regulations, restrictions, everything's changing again. Uh, we just pray uh, before we even open our, our, our service up that the Lord would take total control of this situation again. Um, again, just to announce our plan to reopen our church buildings uh, from Sunday the 11th uh, at 10 o'clock in the parish hall and 11.30 here in the church building. Again, lots of restrictions in place. We have circulated a letter uh, which was emailed and I think it also went out on WhatsApp. If you haven't received that, um, let me know and I'll make sure that letter gets out to you either by hard copy or by email. Also, we're going to have a harvest celebration at Drive-In Church. That's next Sunday, uh, Sunday the 4th of October, uh, up at the Parish Hall car park. Now, that's planned for 11.30. I don't think I gave the time out last week, but it's planned for 11.30, the normal time that we would meet in the traditional church. Uh, and we're going to just mark and remember how good God has been to us this year again and how he's blessed us through the harvest. So please join us. Um, you, you will probably meet with stewards as you drive in who will guide you to a parking space. Um, you will also hopefully be able to tune in on your car radio to the service, just in case it's a really wet day uh, and you can't hear the music that's coming through the speakers in the car park. So you should be able to tune in and we'll give you the details of that when you drive in. Um, today I'm going to be joined by Liz, who's bringing us our slot from the beach, which I tried last week, but it was just a bit too noisy last week, so we're delighted that Liz has managed to record her message um, from the beach on the north coast. I'm also going to be joined by Anne, who will be reading for us, and by Judith, who will be bringing us our prayers. So, as we come before the Lord, we come to meet in his house to worship him. And our opening hymn has exactly those words in it. We have come into his house, we have gathered in his name to worship him. Let's worship.
worship him, Christ the Lord, and that's what we're here to do. We're also going to worship him in prayer, and we're also going to ask and seek, ask for and seek his forgiveness. So let's just bow our heads as we come before the Lord uh, to seek uh, his, his blessing and forgiveness. Loving God, once more we are reminded of our sinfulness. We're also reminded of your goodness. Lord, we acknowledge that we have broken your commandments in thought and word and deed. We have been engaged in pursuing our own ends rather than following your will. We have missed opportunities to work and witness for you. We have been lukewarm in our service and weak in our discipleship. Lord, we have even lost sight of your love and your goodness, allowing you to be crowded out of our lives by other concerns. Perhaps we have even grown a little stale in our faith, closing our minds to that which challenges and disturbs us. Lord, in all these things we have failed. But we thank you that you are a merciful God, that you are slow to anger, and that you are full of constant love. Though we have forsaken you, you never forsake us. However often we stray from your side, you keep on seeking us out, intent on restoring our relationship with us. So Lord, we pray once more, forgive, cleanse, renew, and restore us. Open our hearts to your redeeming touch. Open our eyes to your amazing grace. And help us to amend our lives, to fix our faults, and to live more truly as your people. We ask this in and through the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And we do know that when we ask the Lord in faith for his forgiveness, he is merciful and he forgives. Praise be to his name. It's time for our slot now and we're going to head up from our church here to um, probably the White Rocks, I think. And we're going to catch up with Liz. Over to Liz. Good morning, boys and girls. Teenagers and adults too. Lovely to be back with you this morning. I hope everybody is enjoying being back at school and secondary school or uni or wherever you're at. I hope it's all going well. Now this morning, boys and girls, I want to talk to you about this little stone. And this little stone, I call my little prayer rock. And before we go further, I'm going to read a poem. Guess what it's called? My little prayer rock. This is a little prayer rock. And this is what he'll do. I pop him on my pillow to stay till day is through. At night I'll turn back the covers and climb into my bed. And then my little prayer rock will remind me to knee and say my prayers. When my prayers are finished, I drop him on the floor to stay throughout the night to give me help once more. When I get up next morning, I'll touch it with my toe. So I will then remember to say my morning prayers before I go. I put it back upon my pillow when my bed is made and then my little prayer rock will continue in my head to remind me that my Heavenly Father cares and loves me so. God wants me to remember to talk to Him. Now boys and girls, I want to talk to you about this little prayer rock. And you can have one of these wee prayer rocks too. Next time you go down to the beach, where I am today, or the river, along the side of it, and please take a mum or dad with you when you go, don't go on your own, you can pick up a little stone, maybe a wee small one, just like this, and that can become your little prayer rock. Why do we need one of these? Well, we need one of these to remind us to talk to God. God wants us to talk to him every day, any time of the day or any time of the night. 
But sometimes we are so busy that we could do with a reminder. And adults, how many of us need a reminder sometimes just to talk with God? He wants us to thank him, girls and boys, for all the good things in our lives. For our mums and dads, our brothers and sisters, for our homes, our clothes, our food, our toys, and so much more. But he also wants us to talk to him when things are not just going well. Homework. I can't do this, mommy. Ask God to help. When someone is annoying you at home or at school, ask God for help. When we hurt ourselves and we fall on the bicycle, I've hurt my knee. You could ask God to help there too and ease the pain. <gasps> when we are frightened, we can ask God to be with us and take away that fear. Do you know, boys and girls, there is a constant line to God. He never sleeps. His ear is always listening. So let us start talking to God today. Do you know my little prayer rock, because my wee prayer rock, is also a reminder of a bigger rock. And as you can see where I'm at today, there's a very big rock around me. And that reminds me of the big rock that we can lean on. That rock, Christ Jesus. He came to this earth and he died on a cross and he rose again for you and for me. He wants to hear from you today. He wants you to ask him into your life and to forgive you of all your sins. And he wants to walk this life with you. And adults, he wants to do the same for you today. He wants to become your best friend in this world that we live in today. To help in every situation. So let us now, boys and girls, talk to God. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for who you are and for what you mean to us. We thank you that there is a constant line to you, that your ear is never closed. And we just pray that you will be with us each day in school and at home and whatever we do. We ask that you guide us, protect us and keep us in your care. In Jesus' name. Hey!
Folks, my thanks to Liz for bringing us that message uh, and for that uh, wonderful children's song as well. Real upbeat and lively piece. Now it's time for our first reading and Anne's going to bring us our reading and it's Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as far as he removed our transgressions from us, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones, who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants, who will do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. My thanks to Anne for bringing us our, our psalm for today, Psalm 103. We're going to respond to that psalm, and that psalm is all about praise, and we're going to sing the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Let's continue to praise him now as we turn to his word once more. And Anne's going to bring us our second reading, and that's from 1 Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks again, Anne, for, for bringing us our, our readings today. Um, I've been reading a book by a chap called Andrew Davis. Uh, I've been reading it on the Kindle. I was going to bring the book and show you it, but I've been reading it on the Kindle. Uh, and it's called The Power of Christian Contentment. And as the title suggests, uh, Andrew Davis has a lot to say about the subject of contentment and discontentment. Um, and that book certainly has been part of my inspiration in terms of, of talking about um, or ha having this little mini-series, if you like, about contentment and discontentment. Now, Davis very often refers to the thoughts of a Puritan writer from a way back in the 17th century, Jeremiah Burroughs. Okay? Um, and and he recognised that even back then in the 17th century that contentment was severely lacking in his day too. And he wrote a book uh, called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And some of the wording that he uses is sort of older language, but he defines contentment as that sweet inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. It's a bit of a mouthful. But that delight that is reflected in our first reading, which ultimately leads to praise, how is it that we then get to that point uh, that the writer of the psalm had gotten to where he just wanted to say, thank you God for everything you've given me. I'm so blessed, I'm so content. I want to suggest that not only does Psalm 103 uh, tell us how to get to that point with words like this, he forgives all my sins, he heals all my diseases, he keeps me from the grave, he blesses me with love and mercy, he fills my life with good things so that I can, can stay young and strong like an eagle. The Lord is merciful, the Lord is loving, he's slow to anger, full of constant love, all this sort of rhetoric reflect just how content the writer must have been because he remembers how God has blessed. And the Apostle Peter, in our second read, reading, reveals our reason for confidence, for, for confidence in God and contentment to live in him. He says this, he says to us, you, Christian, you, are a chosen race. The king's priests, that's what you are, if you know Jesus. You're a holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God. I don't know about you, but that fills my heart with contentment. For Jeremiah Burroughs, Christian discontentment was a bit like slapping God 
in the face and questioning his character. As Christians, we, when we question our circumstances, I wonder, do we doubt God's wisdom and God's power whenever we're discontent? However, for, for Jeremiah Burroughs, the, con the content person is able to say this. This is what he writes. The content person says, The Lord knows how to order things better than I do. The Lord sees further than I do. I only see things at present, but the Lord sees things a great way off. And how do I know that? Had it not been for this affliction, I could have been undone. In other words, what he's saying is, things in my life could be an awful lot worse. And if I weren't going through my present difficulties, I just wouldn't be as content as I am. So I will be content. God has provided. It doesn't seem that the world has changed much from the 17th century. And as you, you read this stuff from, uh, from Burroughs that, um, that Andrew Davis has, has highlighted, you could say, well, yes, today in our time, in our culture, things, things have changed and we should be more content. Like our culture's changed for the better. Our, 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 our technology we have is available. It's unbelievable. We have so, so many more comforts than they would have had back then. We can hardly recognize life now compared to what it would have been like in Burroughs' day. But the unfortunate thing is that the same sins lurk in our hearts. But whenever Burroughs writes, he doesn't leave us without hope. He doesn't simply diagnose discontentment. He suggests a way for us to fight discontentment and to be more content. And here's, here's four ways that, that he highlights. He says, first of all, if we're going to be content, we need to hate sin. He says this, the way of contentment is to add another burden to our lives. That is, to burden our hearts with our sin. The heavier the burden of sin in your heart, the lighter the burden of your affliction will be on your heart. And so you shall become more content. Contentment is, is more than just looking on the bright side. We shouldn't just seek to make ourselves happy in whatever situation we're in. And if that is our foundation, what will happen when we do face some bigger issues, some greater suffering? No, he suggests we need to attack discontentment right at its root. We expel it from our hearts by moving our focus away from what we perceive as our suffering and instead think about our sinfulness. When we view our sin as the greatest evil in the world, then virtually any other form of suffering we face will fade in comparison. And that has a tendency to make us more content. So the first thing is, he says, hate sin. The second thing he suggests is that we look ahead. We look forward. We can all go through storms of life, can't be friends. Many of you, I know who are watching this, have been through mighty storms. Some of you are still going through some storms. And if you haven't gone through a storm in your life just yet, you can be pretty sure it'll come along sooner or later. So it's so important for the believer to focus ahead, to focus on the glory of heaven that awaits 
and so content ourselves. Burroughs says, One drop of the sweetness of heaven is enough to take away the sourness and bitterness of all the afflictions in the world. That makes me think of the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Perhaps we can interrupt this short message and play a couple of verses of that. Yeah, let's do that. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. In his blood, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Friends, we've only got one life, and none of us know how long life will be. Perhaps three score and ten, perhaps if we're lucky, a little bit more. And if all our energy is spent fretting and worrying about our life here, and we're filled with discontentment, we've got to ask ourselves, what energy if we spend it all on worry and discontentment, what energy are we going to have when we get to glory? What energy are we going to have to even think about the life to come? There are a few things that we can find that will be helpful for us in our pursuit of contentment. And one of those things is mediating or meditating, rather, on eternity. Any hardships that we go through, any storms of this life, are only momentary. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 and 17, he says, This light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an internal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So when he hits in, we're to look ahead. And then thirdly, he suggests we are to embrace humility. Burroughs writes this, A man who is little in his own eyes will account, will account every affliction also as little, and every mercy as great. Our discontentment springs from expectations that are our own met. Some of us think we deserve an easy life with all sorts of comforts and luxuries and if God wants to bless us in that way that's entirely his call. But we can become discontent when instead of getting that easy life, that comfortable life, instead we have to face hardship or sickness. Yet if we examine ourselves in light of what the scripture says, we'll actually see that, friends, we deserve nothing but condemnation from God. Because we are weak, we are sinful. If we're going to be humble, then I believe that humility allows God's grace to flow in our hearts. That humility that says, thank you, God, for everything that you've given me, even the smallest things. And thank you for using my times of suffering 
and the storms that I have to go, go through as a means of seeing you at work in my life. The humble believer can rejoice in all the good things, all the gifts that he or she has been given, rather than dwelling on the things that we feel we should have, but don't. Hate sin. Look ahead. Embrace humility. And lastly, we're to rely on the word of God. Here's what Burroughs says. He says, Oh, the word holds forth a way of full comfort and peace to the people of God, even in this world. You may live happy lives in the midst of all the storms, all the tempests that the world throws at us. Friends, how can we honestly grumble whenever we think about the promises that God has given us? And I want to share just a few verses uh, that highlight to me how much God loves us, cares for us, and how grace-filled he is. Some of these verses will be very familiar. Matthew 11, 28-30. Come to me, all that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's a promise. And then Paul writes in Romans 8 and 28, he says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So therefore, even the storms God can take and, and use for his good purpose in our lives. Paul also writes in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. God, through what Christ has done for us, has given us new life. Now notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I'll give you a new life with no, problem, with no problems attached. He's given us a new life because we have Christ dwelling in us through his Holy Spirit. A new creation, a whole new being, a whole new person who will have God with us whenever the storms hit. And then from 1 Peter, this time chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfailing. Wow. A new inheritance. Thinking of forward, looking forward again, looking to heaven, looking to glory. So it's important then, folks, that we regularly immerse ourselves in the scripture. The scriptures enable us to see and grasp these promises, but also loads of other promises that, that God give us, gives us, and we should be able to draw strength and through drawing that strength, be content with the promises that God makes to us. Remember, God always keeps his word. God's word really is the anchor in the storm, which will bring us contentment. Sometimes we look around us and we do acknowledge and we, we can see how blessed we are. We have so much. We're coming up to harvest time. Our shelves are full. The selection in our supermarket that we have to choose from is mind-blowing. I'm sure in the time of Joshua Burroughs, the 17th century, there was nothing like it. 
we're spoiled beyond belief. You would think that would make contentment much easier, wouldn't you? Greater riches, greater comforts than there's ever been through history. But we also have far more choices, don't we? As I, as I mentioned about our supermarkets, we walk and we don't know what to buy, there's so much. So therefore we potentially feel that there's always perhaps something more, something better that we can have. If only we could find it. And our hearts can get restless. We can be hungry for more stuff, more things, more money. Stuff that we think may make us content. And, and it's sad to say, but very often Christians can adopt the worst attitude when it comes to these things, when it comes to what we think our needs might be. We feel entitled to what everyone around us has. Comforts, money, freedoms. But friends, if we have found Jesus, then we belong to him. And I think if we belong to Jesus, we should expect storms. We should expect suffering. We should expect hardships. We should even expect persecution. Why? Because he did. He had to not only expect it, but he had to go through it. Jesus gave up all his rights for you and for me. Praise his name. Should we be entitled to any better? Let's try and gain contentment from remembering the, the four areas that Burroughs and Davis are pointing us to. We are to hate sin. We are to look to glory, look ahead. We are to embrace humility. And we are to be totally reliant on the word of God. So, along with Burroughs from right back in the 17th century and Davis, more recent, let's create a better vision than the grumbling, self-pitying world offers. Let's be determined to adjust our eyes to the simple but real and radiant beauty of Christian contentment. Just a final quote from Burroughs, he says, There's no work which God has made, the sun, moon, stars, and all the world, in which so much of the glory of God appears, as in a man who lives quietly in the midst of adversity. And can I add, the person who can live out the words of 1 Peter 2 and 9, and also the words of Psalm 103, and even the thought of the word discontentment should never enter the mind of that child of God. I'm going to let those scriptures that Anne read for us speak for themselves. But I'm going to say only this. Read, mark, inwardly digest these two passages and discontentment should no longer really be an issue. Praise the Lord, all my soul, all my being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and do not forget how kind he is. He forgives all my sins and heals my diseases. 
He keeps me from the grave and blesses me with love and with mercy. He fills my life with good things so that I stay young and strong like an eagle. The Lord judges in favour of the oppressed and he gives them their rights. He revealed his plan to Moses and let the people of Israel see his mighty deeds. The Lord is merciful and loving, slow to become angry and full of constant love. He does not keep on rebuking. He is not angry forever. He does not punish us as we deserve or repay according to our sins and wrongs. As high as the sky is above the earth, so great is his love for those who honour him. As far as the east is from, from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. As a father is kind to his children, so the Lord is kind to those who honour him. He knows of what they are made, he remembers that they are but dust. As for us, we are like grass. We grow and flourish like a wild flower. Then the wind goes over it and it is gone. No one sees it again. But for those who honour the Lord, his love lasts forever and his goodness endures for all generations. For all generations of those who are true to his covenant and who faithfully obey his commands. And verse 22 in closing that psalm says, Praise the Lord, all his creatures in all the places he rules. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O my soul. A picture of contentment. And just to read again, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. You are a chosen race, the king's priests, a holy nation, God's own people chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness and into his marvellous light. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are God's people. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. Let's be content with that. Amen. I'm now, friends, going to hand over to Judith, who will be leading us in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, keep us under the shadow of your mercy in times of uncertainty. Support those who are anxious and fearful and lift up those who are low. Lord, help us to continue to love our neighbours and care for those in need. Be close to those who are ill, afraid or in isolation. In their loneliness, be their compassion. In their anxiety, be their hope. In their darkness, be their light. Merciful God, we entrust to your tender care those who are ill or in pain. Comfort and heal them. At this time, we think of Linda and everyone else who is unwell or sick. Gracious God, give wisdom to those who are searching for a cure for sickness and resilience to those who are caring, caring for the sick, for the vulnerable and the fearful, the ill and the dying, May they know your comfort and peace. We pray for all those who are bereaved and recently bereaved. Lord, today we bring before you the Black family and the extended family circle. Lord, carry them with you in their sadness and loss. Cover them with your love and hold them close through the coming days. Lord, we also thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for Neil and Jan. Hold them safely in your hands and we pray that you would richly bless them from this day forward. Lord, you made the world and care for all creation, but the world feels strange right now. Be with us all and help us find peace. We pray for NHS staff and thank you that even in these anxious times you are with us. Help us trust in you and keep us safe. Amen. Uh, thank you, uh, Judith, for, for leading us in prayer. Before our, our final uh, hymn, uh, which is a hymn called He Knows My Name, I just want to bring you these words of blessing. 
to God who blesses us beyond our imagining, who loves us beyond our dreaming, who forgives us beyond our deserving, and who uses us beyond our hoping. Be praise and thanksgiving, honour and adoration, now and always. In Jesus' name, Amen. Remember next week, folks, we will be putting out a, a, a WhatsApp service which will be recorded from our drive-in. But the drive-in will take place at 11.30 in our parish hall car park. Um, remember to uh, heed the directions of those who are organising the parking uh, and hopefully we'll all stay safe and we'll all be able to worship together once more, albeit in our cars. So until we see you next week, have a safe week, stay safe, stay, stay social distance, and may the Lord walk with you and guide you each and every day. Let's join in the words of the grace. we conclude our service. One announcement I forgot about, an important one, a really big happy birthday to Joy. Greetings from our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, and evermore. Amen.